This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 38 The Victory. Thanks be unto God who giveth us this victory. 1 Corinthians 15.57 Have not many of us in the weary way of life felt in some hours how far easier it were to die than to live? The martyr, when faced even by a death of bodily anguish and horror, finds in the very terror of his doom a strong stimulant and tonic. There is a vivid excitement, a thrill and fervor, which may carry through any crisis of suffering that is the birth-hour of eternal glory and rest. But to live, to wear on, day after day, of mean, bitter, low, harassing servitude, every nerve dampened and depressed, every power of feeling gradually smothered, this long and wasting heart-martyrdom, this slow, daily bleeding away of the inward life, drop by drop, hour after hour, this is the true searching test of what there may be in man or woman. When Tom stood face to face with his persecutor, and heard his threats, and thought in his very soul that his hour was come, his heart swelled bravely in him, and he thought he could bear torture and fire, bear anything with a vision of Jesus and heaven, but just a step beyond. But when he was gone, and the present excitement passed off, came back the pain of his bruised and weary limbs, came back the sense of his utterly degraded, hopeless, forlorn estate, and the day passed wearily enough. Long before his wounds were healed, Legree insisted that he should be put to the regular fieldwork, and then came day after day of pain and weariness, aggravated by every kind of injustice and indignity that the ill-will of a mean and malicious mind could devise. Whoever in our circumstances has made trial of pain, even with all the alleviations which for us usually attend it, must know the irritation that comes with it. Tom no longer wondered at the habitual surliness of his associates. Nay, he found the placid, sunny temper which had been the habitude of his life broken in on and sorely strained by the inroads of the same thing. He had flattered himself on leisure to read his Bible but there was no such thing as leisure there. In the height of the season, Legree did not hesitate to press all his hands through, Sundays and weekdays alike. Why shouldn't he? He made more cotton by it, and gained his wager, and if it wore out a few more hands, he could buy better ones. At first Tom used to read a verse or two of his Bible by the flicker of the fire, after he had returned from his daily toil. But after the cruel treatment he received, he used to come home so exhausted that his head swam and his eyes failed when he tried to read, and he was fain to stretch himself down with the others in utter exhaustion. Is it strange that the religious peace and trust, which had upborne him hitherto, should give way to tossings of soul and despondent darkness? The gloomiest problem of this mysterious life was constantly before his eyes, souls crushed and ruined, evil triumphant and God silent. It was weeks and months that Tom wrestled in his own soul in darkness and sorrow. He thought of Miss Ophelia's letter to his Kentucky friends, and would pray earnestly that God would send him deliverance, and then he would watch day after day in the vague hope of seeing somebody sent to redeem him, and, when nobody came, he would crush back to his soul bitter thoughts that it was vain to serve God that God had forgotten him. He sometimes saw Cassie, and sometimes, when summoned to the house, caught a glimpse of the dejected form of Emmeline, but held very little communion with either. In fact, there was no time for him to commune with anybody. One evening he was sitting in utter dejection and prostration by a few decaying brands, where his coarse supper was baking. He put a few bits of brushwood on the fire, and strove to raise the light and then drew his worn Bible from his pocket. There were all the marked pages which had thrilled his soul so often, words of patriarchs and seers, poets and sages, who from early time had spoken courage to man, voices from the great cloud of witnesses who ever surround us in the race of life. Had the word lost its power? 
or could the failing eye and weary sense no longer answer to the touch of that mighty inspiration? Heavily sighing, he put it in his pocket. A coarse laugh roused him. He looked up. Legree was standing opposite to him. "'Well, old boy,' he said, "'you find your religion don't work, it seems. I thought I should get that through your wool at last.' The cruel taunt was more than hunger and cold and nakedness. Tom was silent. "'You are a fool.' said Legree, for I meant to do well by you when I bought you. You might have been better off than Sambo or Quimbo either, and had easy times. And instead of getting cut up and thrashed every day or two, you might have had liberty to lord it around, and cut up the other niggers. And you might have had, now and then, a good warming of whiskey punch. Come, Tom, don't you think you'd better be reasonable? Heave that our old pack of trash in the fire, and join my church." "'The Lord forbid,' said Tom fervently. "'You see, the Lord ain't going to help you. If he had been, he wouldn't have let me get you. This yer religion is all a mess of lying trumpery, Tom. I know all about it. You'd better hold to me. I'm somebody, and can do something.' "'No, Massa,' said Tom. "'I'll hold on. The Lord may help me, or not help, but I'll hold to Him, and believe Him to the last.' "'The more fool you,' said Legree, spitting scornfully at him, and spurning him with his foot. "'Never mind. I'll chase you down yet, and bring you under. You'll see.' And Legree turned away. When a heavy weight presses the soul to the lowest level at which endurance is possible, there is an instant and desperate effort of every physical and moral nerve to throw off the weight, and hence the heaviest anguish often precedes a return tide of joy and courage. So was it now with Tom. The atheistic taunts of his cruel master sunk his before dejected soul to the lowest ebb, and, though the hand of faith still held to the eternal rock, it was a numb, despairing grasp. Tom sat like one stunned at the fire. Suddenly everything around him seemed to fade, and a vision rose before him of one crowned with thorns, buffeted and bleeding. Tom gazed in awe and wonder at the majestic patience of the face. The deep, pathetic eyes thrilled him to his innermost heart. His soul woke, as, with floods of emotion, he stretched out his hands and fell upon his knees, when gradually the vision changed. The sharp thorns became rays of glory, and in splendor inconceivable he saw that same face bending compassionately towards him, and a voice said, he that overcometh shall sit down with me on my throne, even as I also overcome, and am set down with my father on his throne. How long Tom lay there he knew not. When he came to himself the fire was gone out, his clothes were wet with the chill and drenching dews. But the dread soul crisis was past, and in the joy that filled him he no longer felt hunger, cold, degradation, disappointment wretchedness. From his deepest soul, he that hour loosed and parted from every hope in life that now is, and offered his own will and unquestioning sacrifice to the infinite. Tom looked up to the silent ever-living stars, types of the angelic hosts who ever look down on man, and the solitude of the night rung with the triumphant words of a hymn which he had sung often in happier days, but never with such feeling as now. The earth shall be dissolved like snow, the sun shall cease to shine, but God who called me here below shall be for ever mine, and when this mortal life shall fail, and flesh and sense shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining like the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Those who have been familiar with the religious histories of the slave population know that relations like what we have narrated are very common among them. We have heard some from their own lips of a very touching and affecting character. The psychologist tells us of a state in which the affections and images of the mind become so dominant and overpowering that they press into their service the outward imagining. Who shall measure what an all-pervading spirit may do with these capabilities of our mortality, or the ways in which he may encourage the desponding souls of the desolate? 
If the poor forgotten slave believes that Jesus hath appeared and spoken to him, who shall contradict him? Did he not say his mission in all ages was to bind up the broken-hearted and set at liberty them that are bruised? When the dim gray of dawn woke the slumberers to go forth to the field, there was among those tattered and shivering wretches one who walked with an exultant tread, for firmer than the ground he trod on was his strong faith in almighty eternal love. Ah, Legree, try all your forces now! Utmost agony, woe, degradation, want, and loss of all things shall only hasten on the process by which he shall be made a king and a priest unto God. From this time an inviolable sphere of peace encompassed the lowly heart of the oppressed one, an ever-present Saviour hallowed it as a temple. Past now the bleeding of earthly regrets, past its fluctuations of hope and fear and desire. The human will, bent and bleeding and struggling long, was now entirely merged in the divine. So short now seemed the remaining voyage of life, so near, so vivid seemed eternal blessedness, that life's uttermost woes fell from him unharming. All noticed the change in his appearance. Cheerfulness and alertness seemed to return to him, and a quietness which no insult or injury could ruffle seemed to possess him. "'What the devil's got into Tom?' Legree said to Sambo. "'A while ago he was all down in the mouth, and now he's pert as a cricket.' "'Don't know, Massa. Gwine to run off, maybe.' "'Like to see him try that,' said Legree, with a savage grin. "'Wouldn't we, Sambo?' "'Yes, we would. Ha, ha, ho!' said the sooty gnome, laughing obsequiously. "'Lord, de fun! To see him stickin' in the mud, chasin' and tryin' through the brushes, dogs a-holdin' on to him. Lord, I laugh fit to split. Bad out of time we cotched Molly. I thought they'd a had her all stripped up before I could get em off. She carries the mark so that thar spree yet.' "'I reckon she will to her grave,' said Legree. "'But now, Sambo, you look sharp. If the nigger's got anything of this sort going, trip em up.' "'Massa, let me loan for that,' said Sambo. "'I'll treat a coon. Ho, ho, ho!' This was spoken as Legree was getting on his horse to go to the neighboring town. That night, as he was returning, he thought he would turn his horse and ride round the quarters and see if all was safe. It was a superb moonlight night, and the shadows of the graceful china-trees lay minutely penciled on the turf below, and there was that transparent stillness in the air which it seems almost unholy to disturb. Legree was a little distance from the quarters when he heard the voice of someone singing. It was not a usual sound there, and he paused to listen. A musical tenor voice sang, When I can read my title clear to mansions in the skies, I'll bid farewell to every fear and wipe my weeping eyes. Should earth against my soul engage and hellish darts be hurled, then I can smile at Satan's rage and face a frowning world. Let cares like a wild deluge come, and storms of sorrow fall. May I but safely reach my home, my God, my heaven, my all. On My Journey Home Hymn by Isaac Watts, found in many of the southern country songbooks of the antebellum period. So ho, said Legree to himself. He thinks so, does he? How I hate these cursed Methodist hymns. Here, you nigger! said he, coming suddenly out upon Tom, and raising his riding-whip. "'How dare you be getting up this year row, when you ought to be in bed? Shut your old black gash, and get along with you!' "'Yes, Massa,' said Tom, with ready cheerfulness, as he rose to go in. Legree was provoked beyond measure by Tom's evident happiness, and, riding up to him, belabored him over his head and shoulders. "'There, you dog!' he said. "'See if you'll feel so comfortable after that!' But the blows fell now only on the outer man, and not, as before, on the heart. Tom stood perfectly submissive, and yet Legree could not hide from himself that his power over his bond-thrall was somehow gone. And, as Tom disappeared in his cabin, and he wheeled his horse suddenly round, there passed through his mind one of those vivid flashes that often send the lightning of conscience across the dark and wicked soul. He understood full well that it was God who was standing between him and his victim, and he blasphemed him. That submissive and silent man, whom taunts, nor threats, nor stripes, nor cruelties could disturb, roused a voice within him, such as of old his master roused in the demoniac soul, saying, 
What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to torment us before the time? Tom's whole soul overflowed with compassion and sympathy for the poor wretches by whom he was surrounded. To him it seemed as if his life-sorrows were now over, and as if, out of that strange treasury of peace and joy with which he had been endowed from above, he longed to pour out something for the relief of their woes. It is true opportunities were scanty, but on the way to the fields and back again, and during the hours of labor, chances fell in his way of extending a helping hand to the weary, the disheartened, and discouraged. The poor, worn-down, brutalized creatures at first could scarce comprehend this, but when it was continued week after week and month after month, it began to awaken long silent chords in their benumbed hearts. Gradually and imperceptibly the strange, silent, patient man, who was ready to bear every one's burden, and sought help from none, who stood aside for all, and came last, and took least, yet was foremost to share his little all with any who needed. The man who, in cold nights, would give up his tattered blanket to add to the comfort of some woman who shivered with sickness, and who filled the baskets of the weaker ones in the field, at the terrible risk of coming short in his own measure, and who, though pursued with unrelenting cruelty by their common tyrant, never joined in uttering a word of reviling or cursing. This man, at last, began to have a strange power over them and when the more pressing season was past, and they were allowed again their Sundays for their own use, many would gather together to hear from him of Jesus. They would gladly have met to hear and pray and sing in some place together, but Legree would not permit it, and more than once broke up such attempts with oaths and brutal execrations, so that the blessed news had to circulate from individual to individual. Yet who can speak the simple joy with which some of those poor outcasts to whom life was a joyless journey to a dark unknown, heard of a compassionate Redeemer and a heavenly home. It is the statement of missionaries that, of all races of the earth, none have received the gospel with such eager docility as the African. The principle of reliance and unquestioning faith, which is its foundation, is more a native element in this race than any other and it has often been found among them that a stray seed of truth, born on some breeze of accident into hearts the most ignorant, has sprung up into fruit, whose abundance has shamed that of higher and more skilful culture. The poor mulatto woman, whose simple faith had been well-nigh crushed and overwhelmed by the avalanche of cruelty and wrong which had fallen upon her, felt her soul raised up by the hymns and passage of holy writ, which this lowly missionary breathed into her ear in intervals, as they were going to and returning from work, and even the half-crazed and wandering mind of Cassie was soothed and calmed by his simple and unobtrusive influences. Stung to madness and despair by the crushing agonies of a life, Cassie had often resolved in her soul an hour of retribution, when her hand should avenge on her oppressor all the injustice and cruelty to which she had been witness, or which she had in her own person suffered. One night, after all, in Tom's cabin were sunk in sleep, he was suddenly aroused by seeing her face at the hole between the logs that served for a window. She made a silent gesture for him to come out. Tom came out the door. It was between one and two o'clock at night. Broad, calm, still moonlight. Tom remarked, as the light of the moon fell upon Cassie's large black eyes, that there was a wild and peculiar glare in them unlike their wanted fixed despair. "'Come here, Father Tom,' she said, laying her small hand on his wrist, and drawing him forward with a force, as if the hand were of steel. "'Come here. I've news for you.' "'What, Miss Cassie?' said Tom anxiously. "'Tom, wouldn't you like your liberty?' "'I shall have it, Missy, in God's time,' said Tom. "'Aye, but you may have it to-night,' said Cassie, with a flash of sudden energy. "'Come on.' Tom hesitated. "'Come,' she said, in a whisper, fixing her black eyes on him. "'Come along. He's asleep. Sound. I put enough into his brandy to keep him so. I wish I'd had more. I shouldn't have wanted you. But come, the back door is unlocked. There's an axe there. I put it there. His room door is open. I'll show you the way. I'd have done it myself, only my arms are so weak. Come along.' "'Not for ten thousand worlds, Missy.' said Tom firmly, stopping and holding her back, as she was pressing forward. 
"'But think of all these poor creatures,' said Cassie. "'We might set them all free and go somewhere in the swamps and find an island and live by ourselves. I've heard of its being done. Any life is better than this.' "'No,' said Tom firmly. "'No. Good never comes of wickedness. I'd sooner chop my right hand off.' "'Then I shall do it,' said Cassie, turning. "'Oh, Missy Cassie,' said Tom, throwing himself before her, "'for the dear Lord's sake that died for you, don't sell your precious soul to the devil that way. Nothing but evil will come of it. The Lord hasn't called us to wrath. We must suffer and wait his time.' "'Wait,' said Cassie. "'Haven't I waited? Waited till my head is dizzy and my heart sick? What has he made me suffer? What has he made hundreds of poor creatures suffer? Isn't he wringing the life-blood out of you? I'm called on. They call me. His time's come, and I'll have his heart's blood.' "'No, no, no,' said Tom, holding her small hands, which were clenched with spasmodic violence. "'No, ye poor lost soul, that ye mustn't do. The dear blessed Lord never shed no blood but his own, and that he poured out for us when we was enemies. Lord, help us to follow his steps and love our enemies.' "'Love!' said Cassie, with a fierce glare. "'Love! Such enemies! It isn't in flesh and blood!' "'No, Missy, it isn't,' said Tom, looking up. "'But he gives it to us, and that's the victory.' When we can love and pray over all and through all, the battle's past and the victories come. Glory be to God!" And with streaming eyes and choking voice the black man looked up to heaven. And this, O oh Africa, latest called of nations, called to the crown of thorns, the scourge, the bloody sweat, the cross of agony, this is to be thy victory. By this shalt thou reign with Christ, when his kingdom shall come on earth. The deep fervor of Tom's feelings, the softness of his voice, his tears, fell like dew on the wild, unsettled spirit of the poor woman. A softness gathered over the lurid fires of her eye. She looked down, and Tom could feel the relaxing muscles of her hands as she said, "'Didn't I tell you that evil spirits followed me? Oh, Father Tom, I can't pray. I wish I could. I never have prayed since my children were sold.' What you say must be right, I know it must, but when I try to pray, I can only hate and curse. I can't pray." "'Poor soul,' said Tom compassionately. "'Satan desires to have ye, and sift ye as wheat. I pray the Lord for ye. Oh, Missy Casey, turn to the dear Lord Jesus. He came to bind up the broken-hearted, and comfort all that mourn." Casey stood still while large, heavy tears dropped from her downcast eyes. "'Missy Casey,' said Tom, in a hesitating voice, after surveying her in silence, "'if ye only could get away from here, if the thing was possible, I advise ye and Emmeline to do it, that is, if ye could go without blood-guiltiness, not otherwise. Would you try it with us, Father Tom?' "'No,' said Tom. "'Time was when I would, but the Lord's given me a work among these here poor souls, and I'll stay with them and bear my cross with them till the end. It's different with you. It's a snare to you. It's more'n you can stand. And you'd better go if you can." "'I know no way but through the grave,' said Casey. "'There's no beast or bird but can find a home somewhere. Even the snakes and the alligators have their places to lie down and be quiet. But there's no place for us. Down in the darkest swamps their dogs will hunt us out and find us. Everybody and everything is against us, even the very beasts side against us. And where shall we go?" Tom stood silent. At length he said, "'Him that saved Daniel in the den of lions, that saved the children in the fiery furnace, him that walked on the sea, and bade the winds be still, he's alive yet, and I've faith to believe he can deliver you. Try it, and I'll pray with all my might for you. But what strange law of mind is it that an idea long overlooked and trodden underfoot as a useless stone suddenly sparkles out in new light as a discovered diamond? Casey had often revolved for hours all possible or probable schemes of escape, and dismissed them all as hopeless and impracticable. But at this moment there flashed through her mind a plan, so simple and feasible in all its details, as to awaken an instant hope. 
"'Father Tom, I'll try it,' she said suddenly. "'Amen,' said Tom. "'The Lord help ye.'" End of chapter 38